second talk of the afternoon session. Uh, now we will hear from Florian Tölle, and he will give us a talk about theoretical physics with SimPy. Right, thank you. Um, first of all, show of hands here. Who of you has studied or is studying physics? Great. Um, I have to also to start with a confession. I don't consider myself a real theoretical physicist. I'm more of a material scientist of the theory variety, and I need models from theoretical physics from other people who do real work on real theoretical physics models um, to understand materials. And um, that's why I like more of the, num the numerical side of computing, but sometimes it's necessary to also go to the symbolic side of, uh, of, of mathematics to derive insights into whatever your model wants to tell you. And so it happened this spring that I was in a discussion with the professor, and at the end we were having this blackboard in front of us. And that's the point where I start getting a heart attack, because for me that's uh, black matching, being able to derive this uh, in 30 minutes. Admittedly, that professor was doing that, uh, those kind of derivations for 40 years and not like me. Um, but still, this is the point where I thought, okay, to really understand this, and because we needed to understand this also um, from the mathematics side, um, let's use SymPy uh, or let's use symbolic computing to, to go to, to basically program this model. This uh, model about a 2D material, a, a bit of magnetism. I'll tell you on the second part what's this about. So. Um, I'm one of the young PhDs alluded to in the keynote that uh, uses Python for everything. So SymPy is the package for symbolic computing that um, is, can do similar things to, to Mathematica if someone has worked with that. And in this talk, I want to spend the first half talking about general features of SymPy and uh, introduce them a bit, and then spend the second half um, explaining the, mo the models you've seen on the blackboard and the pretty pictures that it gives us if we go through it in full detail. Um, if you, this is not about a research talk about theoretical physics or about the SymPy physics module, which is a great module for advanced features, but uh, I'm not gonna go into that. I, I, spend, things, uh, I spend time on the more introductory uh, side of SymPy. Um, so. Let's get into the details. What, what do we need to do for symbolic computing? First of all, I'll import uh, the printing uh, functions from SymPy that allow, allow us in Jupyter Notebooks to have a nicer output than just text, uh, a text-based representation of our mathematical formulas. And we can use Unicode or LaTeX to print formulas uh, very pretty. So if people, if anyone has used Mathematica, um, you know that there's a difference between variables in the programming sense and variables in the mathematical sense or symbolic variables. And Mathematica gives a great help to us in that it colors these differently. We see the black things here are variables in the programming sense, the blue things are variables in the mathematical sense, symbolic objects, and the green things here are things uh, to the function that is currently being executed. Um, we don't have the luxury in Python, or in, at least not in Jupyter Notebooks natively. So for every symbolic uh, computation that we want to do, we need to define our variables. So I'll import from the simple module the symbols functions and a few other functions that I'm going to uh, use. And if we want to use a variable, a mathematical variable, a symbolic variable, we have to de define it with the symbols functions. And we give it a name, the x, but then we also have a name that is, refers to the variable in the Python interpreter. So these are two different things. The x here is what Python refers to. The x in, as a string is the name of the variable as SymPy knows it. So nothing really happens if I work with it, with it if I just type that variable, it just gives back its name. Um, its type is it's a, a SymPy symbol. Um, I can also define variables with a few assumptions behind them. So um, here, this could be anything. The variables I define down here can be uh, are, are assumed to be real variables. So they're not complex or um, yeah, anything like this. No, not, not, it's not a function, it's, it's a real variable. And that's a that makes a difference in, for, for certain simplifications, for example. 
if I take the square root of x, which was assumed to be anything, uh, it cannot be simplified further than square root of x squared. If I take the square root of a squared, which was assumed to be real, uh, we can simplify that immediately to uh, the absolute value of a, because it's real. Um, and then those are variables, but then there's also numbers. And numbers in Python are represented by the usual types, int, floats, um, but those are not types that, that uh, SymPy can work with. So we need to use something called simplify, um, the simplify functions on these numbers to represent them to a representation that SymPy can understand and can work with. So as an example, if we have a one over three in Python itself, uh, Python three, that's uh, immediately converted to a float, uh, if we simplify the first number, the one, to a SymPy representation and then divide it by three, that then is a SymPy object. It's a rational, it's a rational number, uh, not a float. We can also use the simplify functions for expressions. So uh, if we have uh, expression 3x squared plus 2x plus 4, we can uh, convert that to a, an expression SymPy can understand and can work with. And for example, here I use a function that substitutes values. I can substitute the x value in this converted expression and immediately evaluate it. Then we can also work with functions, special functions, uh, mathematical functions um, in a symbolic way. So here we give it a symbolic expression, x plus y, and then take the sinus of that, and uh, simply is able to work with that. Um, the, the module knows about, for example, special values of the functions. Uh, the sine of pi half is one, the sine of uh, 40, 45 degrees is square root two over two. Um, so that is immediately able, that's immediately able to um, simplify these expressions. Um, and a slight note, because I'll be using this number a lot in the second part, uh, pi is also a special symbol that represents the exact value of pi and not just an approximation as a floating point number. Um, yeah, these functions are intelligent, so the ex exponential of a log function is uh, immediately uh, simplified. And we also have more mathematical functions, like for example, the spherical harmonics, uh, which can be represent represented here. And um, they are dealt with in a symbolic way, even if we put in numbers for the, for the arguments. So um, pi over two is not an exact, uh, it, it's a, it's a uh, it's a fraction and not a floating point number, so this is still uh, kept as the, uh, at the exact representation. But then we can demand with the n function, uh, if used in the second part here, to evaluate that part numerically. So then we get also the, the numerical evaluation here. We can work with functions, uh, uh, expressions a lot more. We can do differentiation uh, through the diff function, and in the end we give it the variable to with, which, with respect to which we want to differentiate. Um, that works fine, it knows all the rules to how to differentiate. Um, the, the second derivative is no problem at all if we have um, expressions with more, more than one variable or we want to have mixed derivatives, higher order derivative, that's also not a problem. Here, if I want the third derivative, I can just put another y, or if here I want first the second derivative with respect to x and then the y derivative and another y derivative, I can also put a two here. So step by step that uh, it's building up the, the, the derivatives. Solving equations is a very important topic since uh, there the real meat starts. Um, the representation of an equation needs the special EQ function here because the uh, equal operator in Python has a special meaning and um, there's a difference between having a, an equation defined in a mathematical sense or in testing for equality in the Python sense. Um, having an equation, we can use the function solve set um, to get this set of solutions for this equations for, the, for this equation. And um, I say set of solutions because obviously um, in, it's a special situation when there's only one solution. There can also be zero, zero solutions for the equations or implicitly defined solutions or solutions defined on a, on a specific set, for example. And um, it gives, the, the function gives us the complete set of solutions. Um, here's another example. If we want to find out what's the, the half-life half of a certain, uh, in, in the most general sense, we solve the, this exponential equation down here for, for x, and then we get a very general solution back where we see that uh, 
this is defined over the um, over the integers, and um, we see that the, the integer here, two pi n, uh, is also included in the solution. So we have multiple solutions, and this type of solution is an image set, and this occurs very often when you, as I do, work with periodic functions. Um, so it's uh, the, the function over the integers, and this is the function of n. And any n here is uh, a valid solution to the equation. You can put in the a specific value for n through the lambda function with a different spelling than the word lambda, and we get the evaluated solution for the specific value. And this is even quite general because a and b might be complex numbers, so um, this is very, really the, the general solution. Um, there's also, <clears throat> I'm going here through a few basic things that I think are, are very necessary for, for working with it in, in, in physics in my models. So um, here are ordinary differ differential equations. Um, we can define an equation by having a function variable, not a variable as we defined it before, a symbolic variable, but a function. Um, the derivative here is not evaluated because, well, how, how can it? Um, we can solve this, this differential equation. In this case, it's rather simple. Uh, the derivative is zero, then the solution is a constant function. Um, and the C1 here are uh, the constants of integration in, in this dif differential equation. Taking a more complex example, a harmonic oscillator with damping, um, we see uh, a more complex solution. And here we can even put in a uh, in a different function of, of our variable x to, uh, into the function and then the solution in all generality will, have, uh, will also depend on this function. So no problem having that not only symbolic uh, or symbols in it. Um, now looking at this here already makes me frown a bit uh, at this solution down here for the driven harmonic oscillator. Um, and that, that's where rewriting these kind of solutions or these kind of terms comes in. So there's something called common sub-expressions, uh, CSE, and this allows us to um, find common sub-expressions in complex terms. And here, for example, it simplified everything to uh, sum of two exponentials, e plus x, e plus x, and then here's a plus and minus difference. And in the driven harmonic oscillator case, for example, this allows us to not be overwhelmed by the mathematics, but see the structure of, this, of the solution. Here we have two terms that correspond to the expo exponentials, um, and with a bit of insight, one might realize immediately that in certain cases th th this, this becomes the oscillatory part of the oscillator. And here we have the uh, integrals over the, the driving functions. Um, so this allows us to uh, get an overview of what is actually happening in our mathematics. I've already used this in the beginning here. We can uh, substitute certain values. Um, in, in our uh, expressions. Here I set the value of a in this e uh, equation to zero, and then we get a, a simple sum of two exponentials, but we can also substitute more complex expressions. So here I have defined a term, uh, let me just print this, um, 2mxy plus 2myx, uh, and if I want to substitute this term here in the front, with uh, uh, this, this product with something different, with a sum of two terms, I can also do that and it simplifies immediately. Mm. Then, on the topic of simplification, um, if I just put something uh, sine squared plus cosine squared there, um, you might know this is one. This doesn't simplify immediately, but if we use the simplify function, we get the, the um, simple solution um, for, for this term. On the opposite side, we can also expand something when uh, there, there might be a, 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 another way to show this. Here, um, I, I'm expanding uh, the, this trigonal function with the expand trig function, so it knows about the additive uh, laws for, for sine and cosine and so on. Then, the, the last part of these introductory steps that uh, I want to introduce for, for my model later are uh, vectors and matrices. For matrices, Matrices really represent the, what, what in the programming world we might know more as arrays, um, but they support all the mathematical functions here. I have defined an anti-symmetric matrix here with, with symbols in it. I can take the transpose, get the determinant, get the trace, all the linear, linear algebra that you might want to do. Uh, invert or here after simplification and multiplying by the determinant, we see that the inverse of the, this anti-symmetric two by two matrix is actually pretty simple. Um, 
get eigenvalues, get eigenvectors, diagonalize the matrix, that is the standard linear algebra stuff, and they, you could, could also do further uh, other decompositions, QR de decomposition, and so on of matrices. Um, matrix multiplication works uh, very easily. You just multiply the two matrix objects as you uh, would want to do. There's no need to call special functions, but there's also, also a dot function to take a dot product uh, with a general vector with, with a matrix. You can also generate special matrices. Uh, here I am generating a rotation matrix around the, the z-axis, around the three axis, apply it to a general vector, and then we see the, we uh, can use this to play around with, with uh, any kind of linear, linear algebra we want to do. Um, these matrices, that's a different difference from vectors. Vectors uh, represent points in coordinate space and tensors then higher orders. Um, here I'm using SymPy 1.0 because of reasons that will be, become clear later. So here we have to define a coordinate system, the coordinate system Cartesian in SymPy 1.0. Point one, this is called coordinates 3D. And in this coordinate system, we can ha then have access to the, the, the basis vectors and can work with these basis vectors, can take dot products here, cross products. Um, but we can also work with the coordinate vectors in this system. So we can define vector fields or scalar fields uh, with, the, with the coordinate vectors, with the XY vectors, and use um, differential operators, for example, on these fields. So here, I immediately get the, the gradient um, of the so the, the del oper the, yeah, the del operator applied to this uh, scalar field gives me the gradient, and here, in the first step is not e evaluated but just symbolically given to me. But when I use this do it function, which sometimes comes in handy, the uh, um, derivatives are, are evaluated. So these are kind of the basic um, things that you can play with and the basic building blocks for for uh, more complex things. So now I want to come to my physics model that uh, forms the motivation for this talk. So here we're dealing with magnetism, and magnetism um, is, it is in a very simplified form uh, spins or magnetic moments interacting with each other. You might have a picture of a bar magnet in your head that where you and when you put two bar magnets together, you feel uh, a force between them. Um, imagine this bar magnet as, a, as an arrow, and this arrow on an atomic scale, so each atom has one of these arrows, and then these arrows on different atom, uh, atoms interacting with each other, that is basically magnetism. And um, the way to describe this mathematically is um, through interaction terms between the, the, these magnets, uh, these spins, they are called. Um, here I've plotted a crystal structure, the blue points are supposed to be atoms, atoms in this crystal structure, this is a 2D material, and um, the, green, uh, the, the red arrows are interactions between um, nearest neighbor atoms, so, and they will have the strength J1 uh, in energy, that's the, the unit measured to, 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 the unit used to measure the strength. Um, the green arrows then are to atoms that are further away, and they have a different interaction strength because they are further away. And um, uh, there are six of them, but three I've, I've plotted here, they, they will become relevant. And um, the, depending on how strong these interactions are, how strong the competition between those two interactions are, you can have different arrangements of the, the arrows on the atoms. So the one case might be where all arrows point in the same direction, one case might be where arrows point in different directions, but overall they, they are still aligned in one line. And uh, there might be a case in which they form a general spiral state, that is called, a state in which they spiral with a certain wavelength. And um, mathematically, um, the so-called Heisenberg model is used to describe this, uh, this magnetic model. And the solutions the, are the arrangements of spins S1 and S2 here, or SI in general, um, that will determine what is the ground state of the system. This H here is the energy, and we want uh, to find, for, for certain values of J1 and J2, we want to find the values of the spins, the SI, that minimize this, this energy, this H value. And um, we can use something that is called a spiral ansatz, um, where we sum up inter interaction terms over the nearest neighbor atoms with a factor I exponential of IQR plus possibly a, f a phase value. And the Q is what describes the order up here, and the RI value is the position of each atom. 
So um, we can model with that with SymPy. So here I start off, I define a coordinate system um, from, for my vectors. Um, here I have uh, the three different basis vectors for the nearest neighbor atoms. Here I have the three different uh, basis vectors for the next nearest neighbor atoms. And then here I can write down the energy term. So th this is a sum of three cosines for the first one, for the first uh, J1 interaction. Here I write down a term for the next nearest neighbor interactions, the, the, um, the second shell basically. And here I've also included this interaction strength J1, uh, J2. Notice I haven't really put the J1 here because that's, uh, we take everything relative to this. And we also have a face value in here that uh, will give us a lot of trouble. But that's important to keep uh, to, for the description of the system. So at each value of Q, we need the, to minimize with respect to this phase, to this phi. So what, what do we do? We take the, the derivative, we get everything, uh, all the terms that, don't depend, uh, that do depend on phi, um, and now we, solve, uh, we set this to zero and solve this, this equation. Um, and there this double, tr trouble starts. So here, because these are sinus terms, or, uh, cosine terms, uh, it has to be periodic with respect to two pi. Um, and we see that in our equation here, there's a two n pi in here. And, um, we have two solutions for each value of n. Um, we see this because the resulting set, the type of the set is a union. So both of these are solutions. I can use the arcs function of the set to tease apart the, the two parts of the union. And I get back two image sets, so something we have seen before. So for each of these Im image sets, I can then evaluate this for a specific value of n. I take, just take zero because, well, Fine enough, any value is, uh, is valid. And uh, we see that it's still a very complex expression. Um, then I use a trick here to take apart the real uh, parts and the uh, imaginary parts of this, this expression because this is all uh, defined over the complex variables. But still, um, intuition should tell us that the imaginary parts are not important because we, we only dealt with real, real variables before and there should be a minimum for uh, real variables. And here I have those real parts and here I need to start working with numerical solutions to get an insight of what is actually happening. Um, to do that, we can use something called lambdaphy and lambdaphy um, is a function that takes a simple expression and makes out of it a function that we can numerically evaluate fast. So we could also substitute numbers for, for all terms, but that's not a, a fast solution. If you want to evaluate a function multiple times, we should use lambdaphy to make a real function out of it. And here, I've done that for, for a specific, specific function. I get back the, the, the evaluated value. It still is an expression, but d never mind. So now I'm using this for my real parts to make uh, vector functions out of it, also using the numpy vectorized uh, function that allows us to put arrays into it and get arrays out so we don't need to do loops and so on. And let's, we can evaluate these, these derivatives now. So for our two solutions here, we get two different plots um, shown here and here, but we don't know whether they're minima or maxima. So we have to do a second derivative test. This is the second derivative here. I'm not showing this in detail anymore, but we see that some parts of our solution correspond to a minimum, some parts correspond to a maximum. They are, uh, the second derivative is positive or negative, so we have to combine our solutions for the real end result. Now let's put this all together. Here we define a function that takes the, uh, the input parameters, computes the phase, um, and gives back the, the right phase value corresponding to the minimum. And then we get this nice psychedelic plot here of the, the combined phases. Um, we can co insert this now into the energy function that we've defined in the beginning, get numerical results out of here, and then uh, we would have our energy, for example, as a function of J2, or if we insert a, a specific value, also um, a numeric value for the energy, uh, for the minimum energy at this point. So now, let me skip over this. 
we can make a 2D plot over the sole domain and calculate this for several, several different values of our interaction strength, and we get back these plots here in the beginning. And these are plots over the whole Q space uh, that defines which form of magnetism we have, and the minimum in this Q space will then tell us what is the actual magnetic order. And here we see that at low interaction strength, we have the, these dots here at the center at Q equals zero, at a specific value that we can also derive analytically, one over six, we get a broad max, uh, minimum here. And then from there on, we get these circular shaped regions at, at a Q not equal to zero that correspond to the minima in our system. And if we increase our interaction strength, J2, we also get uh, different shapes. So from the circular pattern at the end, this changes to um, like triangular patterns and these kind of pockets we see here. So we see that depending on the interaction strength in this magnetic system, um, there can be different shapes or different magnetic ground states. And this was all done symbolically up until to the end where we need to evaluate this, of course, to generate these plots. And then this was published in the 70s already, this model, but you can easily extend that for more general or more relevant uh, problems to, to your own work, like I did. Um, so that's basically it. Thank you for your attention. Um, when you simplify one of your equations, mm -hmm. is there any way to uh, see how the how Python simplified it, like the single steps, step after step, like you would in Wolfram Alpha, for example? Um, I'm not sure. I think there are quite complex algorithms underlying the simplification. I wouldn't know at the moment how to get them. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have a question about those equations, like the images. They look like evaluated lattice code, and I was wondering if you can use SymPy to produce a lattice code directly? Um, it does produce lattice code that is then evaluated in the Jupyter Notebook to print it nicely. Okay, so, could, could you like uh, write SymPy code in not a Jupyter Notebook and then have it export lattice code, for example? I think yes. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head exactly how to do it, but I, uh, I think it's, it's just plugging into the right place in the print function, or from the output of the print function that you get. Okay, thanks. Yep, yeah, it's online. Um, it's on my GitHub. This is the long link, this is the short link. Um, it shows the, the symbols in a quite complicated form. Uh, so you see this, but th that's the, the normal um, uh, way of printing it, but if you do something more more complicated, you um, you, you see the um, functions uh, that are that are called. So oh, that doesn't turn out as I wanted to. That neither. But you you see the the, the point. You you see the the multiplication signs and so on. So it's not like it prints two y, but two times y, and the this is basically the, the syntax tree. So did you ever use it for covariant mathematics, if you want to have Lorentz invariant expressions? And so um, I personally didn't use it for that case, because that's not the kind of mathematics I deal with. I, there are certain modules in the SymPy physics library that, uh, I'm not sure if they deal ex with that specific case, but with lots of different cases, like differential geometry and combinatorics and so on, there could be something in there. A few years ago, I was looking for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Um, can you directly plot from SymPy, or do you have to numerically evaluate and then uh, plot the numerics just with Matplotlib? You can directly plot from SymPy, and it's quite invariant to um, the, the underlying plotting uh, backend. So let me use the. Anyhow. Um, there are plot functions within SymPy that you can directly call, and they plot a function in the range that you specify, and so on. 1D plots, 2D plots, all works. Of course. For me, definitely, because I'm not able to see the simplifications on, on the blackboard. Um, especially because I don't want to, de my main work is not to deal with the symbolic part, but rather with the applications to materials. So for me, it helps a lot to, to have this, uh, this symbolic computing and the also the, the direct link to the numerics in Python is for me a very po powerful part because I don't need to derive something and then go back and write a separate imp implementation numerically in, in Python to do the same thing again, but I can directly get the functions evaluated. Um. Hi. Uh, did you yet encounter an example or some equations or problems where this uh, implementation of SymPy didn't do the job, so it took too long or something else? Definitely. Um, as soon as sometimes things get more, when things get more involved, um, the things can take a few minutes. That's still okay on my time scale where I work. Sometimes I think things could take for years, uh, could take days, uh, but then some, uh, like a simplification isn't really useful anyhow. Then could it's more, more work to manually look into it. Could you give a specific ex example? Um, specific examples. <laughs> I think if I add it, uh, in, in my case here, if I add, uh, well, it's in the different slide. Like th two or three more layers, and I get the uh, 15 more terms, and the derivative contains more terms, and so on. And then, t for example, taking the solution of that derivative would, I think, be impossible. If you have a, f a sum of 20 signs that uh, sinuses, then probably that doesn't help. Uh, Thanks. That doesn't work. <laughs> 